his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf, sheaf stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? And shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves unto thee? And his brethren envied him. But his father observed the saying. And then they, the brothers go to Shechem to feed their flock and eventually come to a place uh, called Dothan. In verse 18, when they saw him, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And ultimately, at the end of that chapter, they didn't kill him, but they sold him as a slave. And in verse 31, they took Joseph's coat and killed the kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent a coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Let me pause there. Jacob was plunged in to the depths of a terrible grief. Joseph had gone. Someone said this, I think it was Campbell Morgan. It says, we say, seeing is believing. Seeing is not believing. Seeing is seizing. As seeing, believing is trusting God even when we cannot see. At that moment when Jacob was plunged into the depths of deep grief, Joseph of all the sons is gone. But he hadn't. He was already in the house of Potiphar. And God was beginning to mold Joseph to be the saviour of his people, and indeed the saviour of the whole Egyptian and surrounding area at that time. We, rang, we sang that little hymn, Simply Trusting Every Day. How we have to trust. Now Joseph went into the house of Potiphar. Chapter 38 is a different narrative already, altogether. It's Judah, Judah and his incest with his daughter-in-law Tamar, even though he didn't recognize who she was. And the story takes up in chapter 39, where he was brought to Potiphar's house. And the Lord was with Joseph. I want you to grasp that. Joseph could have said, life is falling apart here. How could God be in this? What about all these dreams uh, that the Lord gave me? And, and my father, that word, observed the same, it's a Hebrew word, shama, and it means Jacob knew it, that there was more to this than met the eye. It says his brethren hated him, but his father observed the same. And it means that Jacob knew in his heart of hearts, in the providence of God, there was perhaps something to these dreams. We know, and we'll just mention the unfolding of the story, that they did come, and they did bow down to him. Remember when Joseph was governor of all the land, about 20 years later, the famine has, had gripped the land, and Jacob said, go buy us a little food, and they did. And he knew them immediately, but they didn't know him. Why not? Well, he was a lad of 17, when they tried to get rid of him. 
Now he's a man, 20 years older, and he's in all the garb of the governor of all Egypt. And he spoke to them through an interpreter, understanding everything that they said, but they didn't understand him. In fact, it's amazing that when the brothers came back, they referred to him when they spoke to their father as the man, the man who is the Lord of the land. He was just the man. And even Jacob referred to him as the man. Now, if we're going to look at the province of God, I think we see it in the life of Joseph in three different ways. I could take time this morning, but I'm not, to it would take a whole message to expound Joseph as a type of Christ. He was the beloved son of his father. He was rejected by his brethren. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And I cut it short, by way of the pit and the prison, he came to be the saviour of his people. Now that's just a little pothead biography of Joseph as a type of Christ. But I want you to look at him with me in three ways. First of all, in the security of his family. I call this the place of cultivation. Of all his brothers, Joseph was the only one, apart from young Benjamin, who brought joy to his father's heart. I believe that Joseph listened in rapt attention when Jacob taught him about God's covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob himself, and how he had promised to bring them into the land of promise. He knew about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he was serving that God. And perhaps Joseph was the only son with whom Jacob could communicate with him at a spiritual level. In fact, remember it says, he brought their father to his father, their evil report. That doesn't mean people would have dismissed him as a telltale. He wasn't. He knew he belonged to what would be the patriarchal family, the sons of Jacob, that would become the children of Israel. And he knew what was involved in those covenant promises. His brothers didn't. In a sense, like Esau, they despised their birthright. And Joseph knew what was involved. I'm sure that he listened to the tales of Abraham. He had heard the story of her. He offered up Isaac. And her God provided himself a lamb. Isaac became obedient unto death. And he re Abraham received him from the dead in a figure we read in Hebrews 11. So as a place of cultivation, he also learned that his brothers didn't see eye to eye with him. When he shared the dreams, now I've heard preachers say this, and I boldly disagree with them. They said, uh, Joseph, it was conceit that made him come and tell those dreams. It wasn't. I think it shows how sincere and how transparent he was. Even though they already envied him because his father foolishly showed too much favoritism, to him, but that's because Rachel was the wife whom he really loved, and Joseph was her firstborn. And of course, that was another thing about him. He was born miraculously. It was the Lord who opened Sarah's womb. She was barren. And they said, the Lord hearkened unto her and opened her womb. So there was a miraculous element to her, his birth, as our Lord Jesus was born miraculously when Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost. We want to grasp these foundation truths of our Christian faith. Let's not be iffy or in one shadow of doubt about them. The Lord Jesus was born supernaturally. And he brought to their father their evil report. And that would have confirmed in Jacob's mind that Joseph was maybe really set apart. Maybe these dreams had some meaning. There's so much more we could talk about his communion with his father, the convictions he had, the consecration he showed. Remember when Jacob said to him, I want you to go and visit your brethren, see how they're getting on. They're away bringing the flocks down to Shechem, and then they moved on to Dothan. And Shechem 
was a place of bad memories. Remember Shechem was the place where Simeon and Levi went in and slew the Shechemites when they were sore after circumcision. And Jacob said to him, you've made my, my, you've made my testimony to stink in the land. And yet Joseph went there. When his father obeyed him, he said, I will go. He was consecrated to doing the will of his father and to seeing to the welfare of his brethren in the security in the place of cultivation. And that all ended all too quickly. He was a teenager, a young teenager. He was 17 when all this began to happen. Now sometimes when things happen to us, the devil will come and attack us. The devil is our, he's described in the scriptures as our adversary, the devil, and so he is. And when you're going through a tough time, the devil doesn't say, I'll take a holiday, I'll give them a break. No, the devil will come in and say, your God doesn't know, your God doesn't care. But he's a liar from the beginning. The Bible calls the devil a liar from the beginning. So we have to discard and put from our minds those doubts that he seeks to sow. And of course, he's in the house of Potiphar. And here's the amazing thing. It says he was a captain of the guard, an Egyptian. He probably was the, he was in charge of defense. He probably was the commander in chief of Egypt's forces next to Pharaoh. And it says he was put into the hands of the Ishmaelite, Ishmaelites which had brought him down. And the Lord was with Joseph. Isn't it amazing? The Lord never ceases to be with his people. His promise when he gave his commission to his disciples before he ascended to the Father's right hand from the Mount of Olives was this. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. And lo, there's a go and there's a lo. I am with you always. We used to sing these lovely choruses, many of them are not sung at all now, ever near to bless and cheer in the darkest hour. When I'm tempted, I can feel his power. At his side, I'll abide, never more to roam, till at last, fighting past, he will take me home. I could talk about Joseph's advantages. He's described as a goodly person and well favoured. One commentator said he was a handsome young man. He probably could have got any girl he wanted in the land of Canaan, but here he is, and he's in the house of Potiphar. And the way the scripture, that goodly person and well favoured, the words in the Hebrew, I'm not going to try to pronounce them, I've written them down, it means that he was beautiful in his person and in his countenance. You know, often you've said, maybe of someone who's not too handsome or not too good looking, but you know, they're a lovely person. And of course, true beauty comes from within. The hymn writer put it like this, he said, first flowers soon decay, youth and beauty pass away. But Joseph was a handsome young man, many advantages. Then, he was blessed with an immense gift of discernment. Remember those dreams? The sun, moon, and stars made a business to me, and their sheaves bowed down to his. Remember Joseph observed the same. Jo Jacob, in his heart, knew there was something in this. Not only his advantages, his advancement. Now we know, because God knows the end, from the beginning. In Psalm 139, David said this, you've set me behind and before. You understand my thoughts, even my thoughts, are far off. He said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain unto it. And God had given Joseph that amazing gift of discernment. And he learned in the house of Potiphar the exercise of authority 
and management. Sometimes I've heard Christian businessmen say this, I'm a self-made man. I want to tell you, God has no self-made men. Everything we are and have, we owe to him. David says, and he tells us in Psalm 75, promotion doesn't come from the east to the west. It comes from the Lord. And we have to remember that little hymn that says, Not have I gotten, but what I received, grace has bestowed it since I have believed. When someone pays a compliment, pays us a compliment, we should be humble about it and thank God for any gifts that we have. We have nothing. Another hymn writer said this, that I am nothing, thou art all. I would be daily taught. He was in Potiphar's house. And here's an amazing thing. This heathen general saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. You might say, if you were on my situation, you wouldn't be preaching the way you are. Here's Joseph in a foreign country, in an alien culture, and this Potiphar, this great man, thinks, I've never seen anyone like this before. Why? Because the Lord was with him. I think I brought this quote with me. William Taylor said this. Ultimately, he was cast into the dungeon. And this is what he said. God was with Joseph in the dungeon. And that kept him from overestimating its hardships. God was with him in the chariot. And that kept him from overestimating his honor. The affliction did not sour his heart. And the prosperity did not turn his head. Because in both he felt that God was near him. I've called that the equilibrium of a truly spiritual man. He's in the sphere of his foes. This is very different from the place in his family, the security of his family. Now, you know what happened? Joseph was promoted in the house of Potiphar. He wasn't only advanced, but he had an accuser, Potiphar's wife, dishonest, devious, dangerous. She tried to seduce David, Joseph. There was no one in the house. And she kept trying to seduce him, lie with me, lie with me. And that just didn't happen once. The Bible tells us that this went on and on. It says that, and it came to pass that his master eyes cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, my master, my master doesn't know what is with me in the house. Everything. You know, Potiphar didn't know what he was worth. We often hear that said of people. Joseph knew everything that he had in the house and in the field. He totally trusted it. That's the mark of a true Christian testimony. Every Christian should be full of integrity and trustworthiness. Joseph was. You know, he could have said, I'm in Egypt here. I'm doing well. I don't need to, I don't need to think about Canaan or my father's house or my brother. I can just enjoy myself, make the best of what I have here. Well, he did make the best of it, but in that, in that careless, worldly way. Potiphar, it says that he knew not what he had in the house or in the field. And it says, it came to pass, she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her to be with her. And it came to pass that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there were none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Sometimes, my dear friends, when the enemy attacks, we have to know when to fight and when to flee. And Joseph fled. Do you know the man from whose lips I heard that story that I told to the boys and girls? I heard him preach on this passage once. I was only a very young Christian. And he said, Joseph lost his coat but he kept his character. Remember that. He lost his coat. And then 
the very thing that she grabbed from him, she presented as evidence of what he had tried to do, which he didn't. There are a few things worse. Sometimes if we are criticized for what we have done wrong, we have to take it on the chin and say, I deserve that. But when you're held up to criticism, and it's wrong, it's all lies, it's hard to take. Hard to... And here Joseph is accused of molesting Potiphar's wife. She was the seductress who tried to lure him to sin. And remember how he put it. He said, I'm going to sin against my master. He trusts me totally. I can't do it. But this is how he lifted it to the highest level. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Maybe most men would have said, I have it made. There's nobody in the house. I can have my way. No. He described it as a great wickedness. He says, I can't do it. It's a sin against God. Remember when David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and arranged the murder of her, her honorable husband Uriah. Remember when Nathan confronted him with his sin. He said, I've sinned against the Lord in his prayer of repentance. In Psalm 51, he said, Lord, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil. When he was having his way with Bathsheba, he didn't think it was evil. It was beautiful. He, he, he was lapping it up, so to speak. But as he, the enormity of his sin dawned on his soul, he said, Lord, I've done this evil. He called it the evil that it was. I've done that evil in thy sight. And Joseph had that perspective on it. And of course, Adam Clark put it like this. He said, Satan tempts men to sin and then accuses them as having committed it, even when the temptation has been faithfully and perseveringly resisted. There was an anguish here. Now, we don't read of that in this part of the narrative. Do you know where we come to that? Joseph is still in the sector of his foes, and he's in prison. Now, here's the thing. I've often wondered, and other scholars agree with me in this, I don't think that Potiphar's, Potiphar himself really believed his wife. Because if he had believed her, Joseph would have been, he'd have been executed. That man tried to seduce my wife right. End of story. And there'd have been no there'd have been no question about it. But he spared Joseph, he put him in prison. Imagine you're Joseph. You've come the, from the hills and the fields of Canaan. You've seen God bless those fertile fields. And now you're in the walls of a prison. Somehow the favorable the favorable conditions of being Potiphar's chief chief accountant, chief general manager, has gone. And he's just a prisoner. I wonder how he felt. As we read that quote by Adam Clark, by William Taylor, even in the prison, he knew that God was with him. I remember at our scripture union and, and grammar school, they, they were playing tapes. Remember that? That dates, dates you when you say that. And it was Jeffrey Bull who had been taken prisoner by the Chinese communists and he was in prison. And uh, he wrote a book about his experiences under the communists. And let me tell you, that regime has not changed one iota. The Chinese Communist Party is evil in its very essence. We need to understand our times. Say of the men of Isaacar, they understood their times and they knew what Israel ought to do. But he said this, the thing that kept him going was that he knew the Lord was with him in the prison. No Bible. He read his Bible mentally by recalling the scriptures that he had learned. No wonder David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. The Apostle Paul gave similar counsel. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It will not dwell in you richly if you're not immersing yourself in its truth. I still have such a lot to learn, 
even though I've been preaching since I was 18. This year we're on year 34 to read right through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation when my wife and I first went into full-time Christian work. I vowed that this book would be the man of my counsel and this would be the foundation of ministry. I have a big library of other books and I love that. I'm maybe a bit of a bookworm, but it's the book. It's this word that we hide in our hearts. And I'm sure Joseph in the prison, uh, do you know what happened to him? I'm sure he, he thought of all those things. Do you know what happened in the prison? The governor had seen, never seen anybody like him. And this Hebrew prisoner was put over all the prison. You know what it says? The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with Joseph. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper in a prison. I think it was Charles Swindle who said, prison walls do not a prison make. It wasn't a prison to Joseph. The Lord was still there. And even the prison governor put Joseph in charge. He was in the sector of his foes. There's so much more we could say. Do you know what the scripture says about Joseph? <clears throat> in Psalm 105, it says this, the word of the Lord tried him. We might say it was the rejection of his brethren. That was a trial, and it was. It was the false accusation of Potiphar's wife, and it was. And it was being cast into prison for something he didn't do. But those weren't the things that tried him. There was an element of that circumstantial trial he was going through. But it said the word of the Lord tried him. I believe that Joseph in his heart, through the dreams and through the Lord just working in his heart, had created spiritual ambition in his heart. He knew that one day God would train him. You know, we saw in the life of Moses the 40 years in the backside of the desert weren't a waste. Nothing is a waste in the economy of God. And what happens in the prison? The butler and baker of Pharaoh are in the prison. And they dream. And Joseph interprets the dreams. And as Joseph interpreted, the baker is kind and the butlers restored the office. And this is where we know Joseph went through anguish. He said to the butler when he remembered his dream, and his dream was about his restoration, he said, remember me when it is well with you, because I was stolen. That's the way he put it. I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And it says, yet the chief butler did not Remember Joseph, but forgot him. Another two years. Those two years must have seemed like a century to Joseph. The butler gave that glimmer of light. The Lord will bring me out of here. As for God, his way is perfect. It is. I remember when my wife was told about her cataract surgery. And she had waited for three years, and it was booked for the same day as my surgery in a different hospital. And Muriel got into the car, and she said, David, my surgery's the same day as yours. And we looked at each other. And I had been reading, continuing that Monday afternoon, where I'd been on Sunday, in my Bible readings. I was in Psalm 18, and I had just come to verse 30. And I said to Muriel, it's the God's will. This is the verse. As you opened the door to get into the car, as for God, his way is perfect. That afternoon when I was recovering from my surgery, and God has been good to me, I was back in the pulpit less than seven weeks after my operation. That was the Lord's doing, and still marvelous in my eyes. And I had my mobile, that was the only contact, there was no visiting allowed, and our daughter had come over to be with her mum while I was in hospital, and to take her for her own surgery, 
And uh, she said, David, I'm just through the door. Joanne and I are just back. She says, God, you best. Your surgery is behind you. Mine is behind me. We couldn't have planned this better ourselves. You know, I often think of that word, and we've all known this from we were children at our mother's knee. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding, but we're experts at leaning unto our own understanding. When God asked us just, in the words that we sang, to simply trust him, simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way. I believe Joseph did. And of course, Pharaoh had a dream. I'm going to, to speak for a few moments, not just in the sphere of his foes, and of course in the security of his family first, but in the seat of fame. A heathen king had a dream. Then he had another dream. What has that got to do with the providence of God? Well, everything. All his wise men and all his advisors, they couldn't interpret it. And then the butler says, Your Majesty, I remember my faults, and you put me in the prison. And there was a young Hebrew prisoner there. And the chief baker and I had dreams, and he interpreted them. Bring them. You know, the providence of God is something we will never understand. William Cooper's great hymn on the providence of God, there's a verse that says this, His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. And so, Joseph finds himself before Pharaoh and he tells Pharaoh the interpretation of the dreams. In fact, Pharaoh said, I've heard that you've got this great gift. Many another person would have said, that's right, your majesty. I, I'm the answer to your problems. No. Do you know what Joseph said? It's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Oh, that we would learn that lesson of realism as well as humility from Joseph. It's not me, your majesty. It's God who will give you an answer of peace. And then he tells Pharaoh the interpretation of the dream, you know, about the fat kind and the lean kind and so on. And you know about those dreams and the lean ears and the fat ears. And Joseph said, the dream's won. There's going to be seven years of great plenty, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. And then, because he was endued with wisdom from on high, the wisdom that comes from above is the wisdom above all wisdom, he tells him what should be done. And he says, let Pharaoh appoint a man discreet and wise, to rule over the land uh, of Egypt, that the land perished not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and of his servants. And then he said, Can we find such a one as this? A man in whom the Spirit of God is, and that's capital S. You see, my dear friends, Pharaoh recognized. Do you see when we take our stand for God? The essence of Christianity is Christ in me, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Others see it. He said, this is a man in whom the Spirit of God is. He says, there's none so discreet and wise as you. You'll be over my house, and according to thy word shall all my people renewed. Well, only God could do that. Only God... The Bible tells us he's working out all things. Even on our troubled, turbulent world, even in the life of our nation at this time of grief, he is working out all things after the counsel of his own will. And he's doing that in our individual lives. We should be thrilled at such a truth 
And Pharaoh took off his ring and put it upon Joseph's hand. In the seat of fame, the famine was in Canaan as well. And Joseph said to his, his, his sons, he said, he saw that there was corn in Egypt. He said, why are you looking upon one another? I've heard that there's corn in Egypt. Get down hither and buy for us from thence. And Joseph's ten brethren went to buy corn. But Benjamin didn't go. Benjamin too, you see, was the son of Rachel. And it was Rachel who was the wife he really loved. Remember, he served seven years for her, and Laban tricked him and fogged him off with Leah, but he did his duty, and he served another seven years. He served 14 years to get the girl that he really loved. And Benjamin was also Rachel's son, as Joseph was. And they came to buy corn. And Joseph was the governor over all the land. It was to him that saw him. All the people came to buy corn. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but he made himself strange unto them. Now let me explain something. I've heard preachers criticize Joseph for his attitude to his brothers. We need to get something right. His brothers had virtually left him for dead. He was sold as a slave into a foreign land. They didn't care. In fact, remember what they said when they brought the coat of many colors? They didn't say... Is this Joseph's coat? Is this our brother's coat? They said, is this your son's coat? They had alienated themselves from him. Joseph knew that his father would have been lied to about his disappearance, about his, well, death and birth comes. He knew that. And he had to see that these brothers had changed. He did. And that's why he took the attitude that he did. Remember, God forgave David's sin, for he said to Saul, David, there'll be a price you have, you will pay for what you've done. And they were paying for the price. Now, Joseph began to see that they had changed. Remember, they talked among each other, and Joseph could understand it. And remember, Newman's ribbon said, did I not tell you? Did I not tell you not to lay your hand on him and you wouldn't heed me? And, and we did this, we didn't even see the anguish of a soul. There's where you get another clue. Where Joseph spoke to the butler and said, I was stolen out of the Hebrews. That's an anguish cry. And Reuben says, We didn't even heed the anguish of a soul. And Joseph is listening. Ha, ah, these aren't the same brothers who sold me. 20 years ago and who have allowed my old father to, to wallow in grief for all that time and you remember that Joseph sent him back and uh, his brethren, his sons told Jacob about the man, the man the man who is the lord of the land and they came back a second time and Benjamin was with them Benjamin was with them. And here's the thing. In chapter 44, you read chapter 44 from verse 18 to the end of the chapter. I'd not take time to do that. Where Joseph pleads for Benjamin to be released. The cup, Joseph's cup, is in Benjamin's sack. And the, the serfs, his steward comes and searches. And they know they're not guilty. But it's found in Benjamin's sack. And they all troop back. And the Judah who committed incest with his daughter-in-law. The Judah who was complicit in the selling of Joseph into Egypt. He's a different Judah. In chapter 44, he becomes a type of Christ. He becomes the substitute. He says, let Benjamin go free. And let me bear the blame. Isn't that a picture of the substitution of the cross? Where Jesus took our sins and our sorrows and made them his very own. That's where Judah became the rightful leader of the children of Israel, Jacob's sons. That's why our Lord sprang out of Judah. And he said, let me, let me.
be my substitute. Let me bear the blame. Let Benjamin go free. So those verses, I commend them to you. Chapter 44, 18 to 34. And Joseph has broken down. And we see Joseph as a compassionate man he was. This man who was the governor of the whole land, and he puts all the Egyptians out, he says, cause every man to go out. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he said unto his brothers, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Oh, the conviction that must have gripped him. This Lord of the land is Joseph, whom we sold as a slave. And then Joseph said, Don't you be afraid and angry with yourselves. God did sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve your posterity in the earth and to save your Sells your lives by a great deliverance. So it was not you that sent me there, but God. Those two simple words explain the providence of God when we're overwhelmed by our circumstances. But God. Later on, he said to them, You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Remember, they came back with all the wagons. And Jacob didn't believe them. He thought, don't do this to me. And he says, they told him the words of Joseph. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Something that had died in him 20 years came to life again. He says, Joseph's alive. I'll go and see him before I die. Later on, and they're going to have to cut this short. Joseph brings Ephraim and Manasseh as two sons. And Joseph adopts them as his own. He said, as Reuben and Simeon, Manasseh and Ephraim will be like my own sons. And he said this to Joseph. I didn't think I'd see your face. And I've seen your face, but I've also seen your sons. Let me just turn closing to a verse in the Roman epistle. It's in Romans chapter 11. And this is what the verse says. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Thank God that we have a God we can never fully understand, but we can know him as the one who whose providential care over us never ceases. I don't know what your circumstances are this morning, but let me say this. We can learn to trust his heart even when we cannot trace his hand. May God bless what has been shared from his word. We didn't start at about five past twelve. We've been a bit longer than I